Uh, my name is Ray McGovern. I grew up in New York, but came down here after John Kennedy uh, suggested that we might ask uh, what we might do for our country rather than what our country might do for us. So I was one of those who came down in the early 60s. Uh, I did two years as an Army officer in intelligence in the infantry. And then when I heard that the Central Intelligence Agency had a need for people with my background, which included a graduate degree in Russian studies, I said, well, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. And uh, when they told me what I'd be uh, assigned to do, I just got very enthusiastic uh, that I would be in a position of analyzing things that might get to the President of the United States. It was hard for me to believe at first, but uh, it turned out to be true. And it was a very enlivening career for 27 years. Uh, so uh, that's, that's now I work in the inner city uh, as co-director of the Servant Leadership School which trains people to become involved with people on the margins, to help them be helped by them, and to be able to sustain that work, which is, uh, which is quite a trick. Uh, if you get involved in that work, you very often burn out unless you, you know certain basic things like the need for community support and that kind of thing. Hmm. That's great. Um, did you want to say that? Um, tell me a little bit about what um, a CIA analyst would do with the information that's coming in. Well, the, uh, I worked in the Directorate of Intelligence, which was the analytic branch of the CIA, and we were really pretty much uh, tasked with doing the most important uh, uh, tasks of the CIA, which are two, really. Uh, one is to sit oh, as the... Okay. Background noise. It's really loud. Yeah. Is that, was that a plane? Yeah. We just might want to wait for it to go by. We should have uh, plugged in with Homeland Security to get this whole <laughs> quarantined yeah. off today. Yeah, yeah I, I was an all-source analyst, and that meant uh, that I would, I would come in in the morning and in my inbox would be uh, data information uh, from open sources, from spies, from liaison services, from intercepts, from overhead photography, uh, from attache or embassy reports, the whole spiel on my area of interest, which was Soviet foreign policy, would be right there in my inbox. It would be my task to make some sense out of it. And when I referred to the main tasks of the CIA when it was established in 47, uh, the overriding need was one central place, okay? They had been through Pearl Harbor, there were little snippets lying out there, but no central place where one person has all the information that's possible to have uh, before one draws up conclusions. And so that's one, the, the other aspect that's very important is that uh, we be a place where you can speak the truth without fear of favor, uh, where we don't have to worry about what the State Department is saying, what Defense Department is saying that we could really look at this information, come up with our conclusions based solely on the merits of the case, and uh, ensure that that gets to the president, which was pretty heady stuff, which uh, is hard to believe in this town because this town is so politicized that when you tell someone that there's one place, there's one place created by Congress uh, not to have a political agenda, uh, there's sort of, the general reaction is eyes water over, you know, and. Uh, the uh, shoulders shrug and uh, there are sort of just uh, feelings of disbelief that that could be possible. And the closer you work with Congress, of course, the harder it is to believe that it's possible. And the uh, supreme irony and the terrible damage that has been done is that uh, this administration has made it well nigh impossible to speak without fear or favor. So talk a little bit about um the build-up to the war when you were tracking the news and following the news and mm -hmm. kind of draw some analogies about how you would use kind of the mosaic theory of um, mm -hmm. analysis where you're taking information yeah. for a lot of different sources and kind of piecing together a big yeah. picture of what was going on. Yeah, I guess I had a terrific advantage because uh, I cut my teeth in intelligence analysis on the Soviet Union. and. The information on the Soviet Union in those days was 90% open source information. Actually, there's a subdiscipline of political science called media analysis, which uh, our people, starting in 1941, after Pearl Harbor, uh, monitoring Japanese broadcasts, that our people are refined to a real science. And uh, 
And anyone watching the Soviet Union, anyone analyzing the Soviet Union would have to become a master at that science. It was almost like you got an MS in that before you could do anything useful. And so it came to me naturally. And so when I watched, uh, oh, starting 18 months ago, when I watched the, the administration banging the drums for regime change uh, in, in Iraq and thought that rather odd, you know, we hadn't been in the business of, uh, of you know, invading com countries to cause regime change uh, before, then I started looking at the evidence very, very closely and my colleagues as well, uh, some of the alumni that uh, I respect very much, that I worked with for 27 years, uh, were also watching this closely. And uh, we would compare notes when we wrote an op-ed or another kind of article, and we'd give each other sanity checks because some of the conclusions we were coming up with were, were pretty strange, you know, with respect to what this administration was trying to do. And so in January, uh, we decided that uh, those of us who had been giving each other these sanity checks, perhaps we could uh, form a movement that would be perhaps uh, bigger than the sum of its parts. And so we did, five of us formed the uh, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. And uh, the sanity comes from those sanity checks and also from the fact that there wasn't a lot of sanity going on here in this town at the time. I mean, the people who were running our Iraq uh, policy uh, were well known in the 80s as the crazies. Uh, that's when you said, "Oh, the crazies did this." Everyone knew exactly who was meant. It was Wolfowitz. It was Fife. It was Wormser. It was Bolton. Who am I leaving out? Uh, uh, sometimes it was Cheney, uh, Rumsfeld. Uh, they were known as the far-out folks that really had to kept had to be kept far out. And so, so the president's father, for example, uh, when one of the crazies, Wolfowitz, came up with a with a document uh, for the Pentagon called the Defense Posture Statement in early 1992. It was so outrageous uh, that someone leaked it to the New York Times and President Bush the first was faced with the decision, how, how do I handle this? So I called in Brent Scowcroft, his National Security Advisor, and Jim Baker, his Secretary of State. And said, I thought, thought we were able to contain these crazies. Who, who wrote this? Well, it was Wolfowitz in defense. Oh, God. Well, what do we do with it? We throw it in a circular file, what we do it, and we disavow it right away, which he did. You know? and he called uh, Cheney, who was then Secretary of Defense, and said, hey, look, uh, you know, no more of this stuff from Wolfowitz. Huh? Let's, let's be a little bit more sensible. Now, the supreme irony is that we watch these crazies come back into town with President Bush's son. And they weren't at middle levels of the Pentagon anymore. They were running our policy toward the Middle East, and still are. And so, uh, and so, that's really the, the the really major problem there. Get it? Another. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I wanted to uh, to ask you about um, kind of a sense of, of history that the media will um, sometimes forget to incorporate and put things into context. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, on September 15th, uh, the Sydney Herald in Scotland broke the, the link between progress for a new American century, uh, connecting it with Iraq, and that was the first time anyone had made that connection. And then it, it showed up in, in England and um, Australia, all these foreign countries. So uh, talk a little bit about if it's appearing in the open press overseas, um, how is that being interpreted by their intelligence agencies, and how is that a document like that incorporated to their decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the most interesting indication of how uh, the foreign press and foreign intelligence services uh, found it a little easier to get it right uh, was the example of uh, uh, Andrew Wilkie in, in Australia. Now, he was a senior intelligence officer. He had already had a career in the military. Uh, retired as an army colonel. There aren't all that many army colonels in the Australian army. And went into intelligence and uh, and in his testimony uh, he quit eight days before the war because he couldn't abide the deceit that was going into justifying the war. Uh, he uh, testified before a joint committee of their parliament uh, that uh, we have our own little unit that analyzes 
U.S. foreign policy. Now, in the trade, we say there is no such thing as a friendly intelligence service. Okay, we all monitor, we all analyze the policies of one another's government. That's just the way it is, the way it has to be. Well, his analysts of American foreign policy, the ones in the Office of National Assessments, which is Australia's opposite number to CIA, had uh, come up with the real reasons for this war. And it didn't have anything to do with WMD, weapons of mass destruction. It didn't have anything to do with the non-existent ties between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. It had everything to do with the documents and the thinking incorporated in the Project for a New American Century documents. And those documents were, were written by the crazies, and these same crazies who were working also for the Israeli government and wrote similar documents for Prime Minister Netanyahu, for example. And so those were the documents that made it clear to people like Andrew Wilkie and his colleagues in the Australian Intelligence Service that it was a much different uh, case. There was a much different U.S. objective than what they were saying rhetorically. And so uh, Andrew Wilkie uh, made this known in his testimony and said, look, uh, don't pretend to have been deceived by this. We told you. We told you exactly what the Americans were, were doing. And all it took was uh, a familiarity with the web and just typing in project for a new American century dot com or org, whatever it is. And there, it, it was the it is the Mein Kampf of the neocons. You know, Mein Kampf was what Hitler used strategic ideological justification for what he did. Well, so too is this this strategic ideological vision, the the justification, if you will, for what they call a preemptive war. But since there was nothing to preempt, it can only be called a war of aggression. Okay, I'm going to uh, to move to um, kind of the overview picture of the propaganda campaign of what we know now. Um, kind of uh, maybe a uh, a quick overview of the different main points, uh, trying to establish that the premise that there was an orchestrated, uh, coordinated you know, camp, uh, PR campaign and propaganda propaganda campaign to sell the war, uh, and then move on to kind of the timeline and leading up to the war. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about the propaganda campaign what, from your perspective? Well, the uh, propaganda campaign went hand in glove with the political campaign to uh, get permission or to get approval from the uh, U.S. public and from the Congress for this war. Um, the decision was made uh, uh, in spring uh, of uh, 2002 to have this war. Um, Andy Card, the chief of staff of the White House, made that famous remark, well, you don't market a new product in August. And so, uh, and so we were all waiting for some dramatic announcement in September. Uh, Vice President Cheney, however, a real aficionado of preemptive strikes, did his own little preemptive strike, uh, still in August. So while uh, the Secretary of State Powell was sunning himself in East Hampton, and while the President was still down in Texas, uh, Cheney got up before the microphones and, and set the tone by saying, Saddam Hussein is embarked on a search for nuclear weapons. He could have one soon. And uh, UN inspectors, so that's, the f that's a feckless exercise. Never achieved anything, never will, so don't go down that road at all really extreme positions. Everybody else out of town, this was the no policy. So when they came in out of, from out of town after Labor Day, uh, they sat around and they said, well, okay, now, uh, wh what do we need to do? Well, we need to, somebody said, well, there's this, uh, there's this constitution, and uh, bummer, it says that uh, Congress has, has the power to declare war, so I guess we ought to we ought to bring Congress into this and get them to approve it. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, how about Cheney's speech? Well, they're not going to be persuaded by Cheney's speech. How about that na brand new national security strategic document that we just issued last week? A lot of them don't like this idea of preemption. So we got to give them something substantive to hang on to. Well, what could that be? Well, uh, how about uh, the ties between Iraq and Al-Qaeda? 
that's, you know, tie that with 9-11, that's gonna work. Damn, I can't do that. Why not? Well, those wimps over there in the CIA, you know, they still can't find any good evidence, they say, you know. Chalabi and those fellows, they can find it. You know, they'll give us what evidence we pay for. But those guys, so if we make it on that rationale, those fellows from the analysts from the CIA will come behind us and pull a rug right out from under us, so we can't do that. Well, okay, how about, I know, um, biological chemical weapons. We know they had them, you know. Bam, bummer. The Defense Intelligence Agency has just writ a, written a formal memo which says that we, we don't know that they have these biological chemical weapons, and we certainly don't know whether they're producing them. So again, if we go to Congress with this rationale, we'll get shot in the foot by these wimps over there in Defense Intelligence Agency. What are we going to do? Oh, I know. What we really need to do is make a case for this nuclear thing. I mean, that's what Vice President Cheney did so well. He did a great job, Dick. Now we have to make that stick. Now, what do we have in terms of evidence? Aluminum tubes. Uh, Condoleezza, remember, you did a great job on the radio there last Sunday about saying those aluminum tubes could only be used for a nuclear application centrifuges. Th that'll do it. Well, I'm sorry, but I... I have touched base with the experts now at the Department of Energy, and and they kind of they dismiss that possibility. They say that these aluminum tubes could never be used in an application, or if they did, they say pretty much that if Saddam Hussein is, thinks he can use that, that, have him order as many as he wants, and you know, unpay as much as he wants, because it'll never work. So we can't use that either. Bummer. Well, we ah, somebody says, how about that report that. Uh, Iraq was seeking uranium from the African country there. What was it? Niger, yeah. That'll do it, you know? Uranium, they only can use uranium. For, that, that's, that's what we can use. And if George Tenet was there, he would have had to say, well, yeah, we, we looked into that, and uh, it's, it's false on its face. I mean, the government of Niger doesn't have the power to sell or give uranium to Iraq. All the uranium mined in Niger is controlled by an international consortium run by the French. Every ounce that's mined there is controlled. It couldn't happen on the face of it. And besides, we just found out the original report's based on a forgery. So it's sort of like a false lie, you know? <laughs> so we can't use that. Why can't we use that? Well, who knows about, who knows about this stuff? Who knows that it's based on a forgery? Who knows that it's fake, false on its face? Well, we, nobody else, uh, the UN has been banging on our door to, they heard about this, they want to access, but we haven't let them have access to this. Well, how long can we put the UN off? Oh, I imagine a couple more months. Ha! So what's your problem? We'll use this Iraqi search for uranium in Niger as evidence, tangible evidence, of an Iraqi nuclear program and we'll raise the specter of a mushroom cloud. That'll do it with the congressman. You know, who wants to take a risk that the first evidence might be a mushroom cloud? So let's do that. Uh, we'll persuade the House and the Senate to vote for, for the war. We'll have a war and we'll win handily. I mean, the Iraqi forces are on their back. We know that from all the sanctions and everything else. We'll win it in a couple weeks, and then the people will welcome us with open arms and cut flowers. And then who's going to care? I mean, they ask you, who's going to care if the original rationale, the original cell job, was based on forgery or based on something that was false? So they say, you know, who's going to give it at that, that point? And so they went, oh, and besides, Carl Rove is in these discussions, Carl Rove, and besides, you know, we got an election coming up in about six weeks. Just think how hard it's going to be for Democrats to vote, to, to endanger this country f uh, to a mushroom cloud. And I think we can really play this for all it's worth. Those who vote against it, uh, they're going to be in real trouble, maybe. And so we, we might even make gains in this midterm election. So, yeah, this seems like a really good idea. And that's exactly what they did. It's the most crass, the most cynical, the most deceitful campaign that I've ever seen in terms of any country justifying uh, a decision to make war. My own country gives me no joy to say that, but in retrospect, it 
it's even clearer with the absence of weapons of mass destruction, with the president himself now admitting that there were no ties between Saddam Hussein and 9-11, and, and with these ex post facto, these, these, uh, uh, these explanations, uh, retroactive explanations that, oh, no, no, we really want to just get rid of Saddam Hussein, or no, no, what we really want to do is democracy in, in Iraq. We're going to impose democracy on, on Iraq, whether they like it or not, and we'll make sure that that uh, we hang in there with our forces and maybe with our four military bases, and and uh, it would be nice to sit on top of all that oil. So, so it, it just uh, was quite a, quite remarkable. Now we, we saw this coming, and the veteran intelligence professionals for sanity, starting with uh, Secretary Powell's speech on the fifth of February this year, we documented all this. We sent four memoranda to the president himself, made no secret of it, put it on the website, some of it was published, mostly in the foreign press, interestingly enough, not in the U.S. press. But uh, we could see it coming. As a matter of fact, this famous State of the Union address where the president was, was fed information that was patently false, uh, we had an article in the Birmingham News that day in the morning which warned the president, please, Check this out with your intelligence experts. Don't be, don't don't let uh, your political folks uh, have you shooting yourself in the foot with hyperbole, you know. And in retrospect, that one really looks uh, really looks um, like we were right on the mark. So it's not as though this was this was a big secret to anybody who was paying attention. And of course, our allies, who are feeding off precisely the same intelligence base came to their own conclusions. The French and the British, the French and the Germans, for example, with whom we share virtually everything, could see that this was all contrived, uh, could see that some of their sources, which they had reported with great caveats, saying, well, we don't know about this, this fellow. He says he's in touch. We're not sure he has this right access or whether he's telling the truth. He has an unproven record. Well, they see Colin Powell uh, starting his speech citing those, the information from those same sources saying this is absolutely solid intelligence. And so they know what the game was. They could also read the Project for New American Century documents. So on uh, March 14th, there was an AP story by uh, John Lumpkin who was talking about your um, plea for um, intelligence professionals to leak information or to get information out there. And mm -hmm. the uh, spoke, uh, spokesman for the CIA, Mark Mansfield, said, you know, well, Ray, he's, he's been retired for 10 years. He doesn't really have any, um, you know, way to, to know any of this information. Mm -hmm. What's your response to that? Well, I, I would just simply say, where are the weapons of mass destruction? Ray was saying there weren't any, or if there are some, they're certainly not there in the quantity that would, and by any stretch of the imagination, justify a war. And so where are they, you know? It's interesting that uh, uh, the press spokesman for the agency would dismiss us with such kid gloves. I mean, they could, they could do other things like they did to uh, Valerie Plain and then so forth, but, but they all know that uh, we sort of graduated with, with honors, so to speak. They all know that we have uh, copious encomia from the president's father. And they all know that we have our own reputation among the analysts in the CIA. And so they have to be careful with respect to how far out they go and, and, and impugning our, our uh, integrity or impugning our knowledge. Uh, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. Any political scientist worth his or her salt who knows the least bit about media analysis could have seen just as we did, what was, what was going to happen. We were still shocked that uh, nobody blew the whistle on it. Just Andrew Wilkie in Australia, we were still shocked that there was no one that, that, that followed the example of Daniel Ellsberg, who admits that he did it too late, you know. Uh, we were shocked that uh, there were so many good people with integrity that we left behind us in the intelligence apparatus that didn't see what was coming and, and speak out beforehand. Uh, but now I, th I do have hope that uh, those hundreds, and they're literally hundreds who know about the lies, that as they retire perhaps, and as they pay off their mortgages or their kids graduate from college, that they'll feel a little freer to say, yeah, this is what happened. At any point during the 
you know, eight months in the buildup, were you in contact with anyone that was still working with the CIA, or was all your information directly from open source? No, uh, you know, it was sort of like the 90% uh, uh, ratio again, 90% from, from sharing with one another and from the open sources, but a, a very vital 10%. Not from clandestine sources, but from sources within the intelligence community, uh, people who are still there, who are, are sort of whose morale has been really shot, uh, but who are hanging in there, trying to to hope against hope that uh, uh, they'll live to fight another day uh, when a uh, when a leadership comes in that will allow them to do the job that they're paid to do, and that is uh, to assemble all the information and then uh, convey it analytically, without fear or favor, with no policy agendas or axes to grind. Hmm. On uh, February 24th, Newsweek broke the Hussein Kamal story, and then it was kind of ignored for a few days. And uh, But immediately, Bill Harlow of the CIA denounced it and said it's totally untrue. Hmm. What do you say about, do you really think that he was uh, telling the truth, or was he protecting the agency in that case? What do you make of that situation well, and kind of recap that? Well, the the objective or the job of the uh, CIA spokesman or woman is, is to protect the agency, that's that's the job. And so when Hussein Kamel, uh, when it became known that Hussein Kamel, whom everyone from the president on down had touted as the epitome of of how much an effector, a defector, can can really help uh, in contributing to our knowledge base. When it uh, turned out that he also said, in addition to the information he gave about chemical and biological warfare, he also said that all those chemical and biological weapons and resources were destroyed at his order uh, when he told us that in 1995. That somehow never, never got out. And it took a very enterprising uh, person from Cambridge, uh, Glenn Wagwala, to go over to Vienna and find the debriefing briefing report and then to report that. Now, there's a big story. <laughs> How big a story? How can you get a bigger story than the head of the chemical, biological, nuclear, and strategic missile program in Iraq, Saddam Hussein's son-in-law, who was in charge of all that, uh, tells us when he defected in 95 that those weapons, there were no nuclear weapons, but the others were all destroyed at his order, okay? Everything else he told us panned out pretty well. The president and everybody else says he's a great source, but nobody acknowledged that he also said that. And so Newsweek gets this story. Where do they put it? Periscope, you know, little little blurb there in the beginning. Most people just by that, you know. And uh, no, nobody takes much notice of it. We took notice of it. I mean, that seemed to be the answer. Why were they having such trouble? Why couldn't they give uh, evidence of where these things were to the to the UN inspectors? Uh, well, the obvious the answer could be, could it not, that Kamal Hussein was telling the truth in this respect as well. Of course, it turns out that he did tell the truth, and then uh, these weapons were destroyed then. Hans Blix has an interesting way of, of putting it. He the, was the chief uh, UN weapons inspector. He said, you know, it, it was really remarkable that the U.S. government had 100% certainty that there were weapons of mass destruction and 100% uncertainty about where they were. Yeah, it's kind of hard to, hard to conceive that you would be so certain that these weapons existed if you didn't have any evidence where they were. What was the evidence? These defective reports that uh, the Defense Department was paying through the nose for Chalabi and his and his emigres to manufacture. Why were they not dismissed out of hand? Well, I'll tell you one reason that hasn't really come out very much. It used to be that the Central Intelligence Agency had a crackerjack outfit called the National Photographic Interpretation Center, and it was their job to analyze all imagery that came down from the skies. Not to collect it, that was always the Pentagon, but to analyze it and to drive the collection, you know, to, to inform what, what needed to be collected. These were the folks that discovered the missiles in Cuba. These are the folks that made it possible for us to tell President Reagan, yes, we can verify arms control agreements. So it's just a very, very essential uh, 
function that they would uh, perform. These were the folks that were able to say no. Uh, they don't have 3,000 uh, SS-25s, they only have 20, and these are the photos that can prove that, you know. So this, uh, this body of some 600, 700 well-experienced analysts was given to the Pentagon, taken off, locked, out, locked off from the CIA, and given to the Pentagon in 1996 by John Deutsch, who was then director of the CIA, and who had made no no disguise of his pretensions to become Secretary of Defense. Well, why do I mention that? Uh, I mention that for this reason. In the old days, if we had a defective report that said a chemical facility is under construction at, at these coordinates, the first thing an analyst would do would be target the photography, get a picture of it, and compare that with previous pictures and, and say um, yes or no. Well now, who controls the uh, imagery analysis, Donald Rumsfeld, okay? Now he's got a favorite defector saying there are three chemical facilities here. They get the photography. It's going to take a very courageous young analyst to say, nah, they're talking through their nose. And even if he has that courage, the major that he works for is going to say, ooh, oh, I'm going to tell my off can tell the colonel this? And the colonel, if it gets that far, the colonel going to tell the general? And is the general going to tell Rumsfeld that these favorite sources of his don't know what they're talking about? I don't think so. And so the fu function of the Central Intelligence Agency, which is to tell it like it is without fear or favor, has been not only corrupted with what they're still doing, but this whole unit was lopped off. And so it's ipso facto no longer able to speak objectively. It reports to the Secretary of Defense. And so what, why was it that all these reports were were given the credibility that uh, they didn't deserve, well, there's no check on them. Or if there was a check, people were too intimidated to speak out and say, hey, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld, uh, your emperor has no clothes on, neither does Chalabi. Hmm. Um, I'm going to go through a, kind of a lightning round here, um, and I'm going to give you uh, the timeline and then think about whether or not the uh, there was enough information that the media could have followed up on, or if it was, uh, you know, they did their best job to okay. get all the information. Let me ask you, excuse me while I just sure. go to men's room for a second. Okay. No, Retrace and kind of put yourself back as if it was, you know, uh, you don't know any information other than what you know up to that point. It may be a little tricky, but just think, I'll try to run through it in order know. so you can kind okay. of build up. Um, let me know if I'm not getting it right, you know. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if uh, if it's something that's off point, or uh, I'll, I'll just stop and go. Um, okay. So, uh, what were your thoughts when you heard uh, Cheney's speech on August 26th? I said, "My God, it's still August." I thought this marketing campaign was going to be rolled out, uh, you know, in September. Uh, it was very, very curious because it was of a tone and a degree and a vehemence that, that had not been present in any of the other speeches, including Rumsfeld and the President. And so it was really uh, clearly a preemptive uh, attack here, so to speak, and, uh, and that would happen before they all got back to Washington it seemed to me transparent. And yet I saw none of this in the press. I mean, where were the journalists who could take a look at this and say, hmm, this is strange, it wasn't supposed to be till, it wasn't supposed to be in August, number one, and, is the vice president speaking for everyone? You know. And um, and uh, let's see. Um, okay. Uh, the um, the links to Al Qaeda, which uh, I get. Well, let's let's do uh, on. September 8th is when they kind of kicked off the uh, aluminum tubes, mm -hmm. and, um, and they had Cheney. But and, and when uh, when I say this, try to you know just recap mm -hmm. the, the the event. Uh, Cheney, Powell, Rumsfeld, Rice, and Dick Myers were all on the Sunday talk shows talking about the aluminum tubes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The aluminum tubes was a really interesting episode. Uh, it was very clearly coordinated with the British and with the New York Times and, and Washington Post and so forth. And uh, um, the the 
point of it all, of course, was to have some tangible proof that what Cheney had just said was correct, namely that the Iraqis were seeking nuclear weapons. Condoleezza Rice went the furthest, and she said, well, these uh, aluminum tubes could only be used in a nuclear application. And this, of course, was before she checked with the Department of Energy experts, and these are the experts there, and they laughed themselves silly. They said, you know, if, uh, <laughs> if Saddam Hussein thinks he can use these in a nuclear application, you know, have him buy as many, sell him as many as you want. You know, he's in for a sorrowful surprise because uh, they can't be used that way. They're not suitable they're for rockets, and of course they turn out to be right. So, but you know, the cynicism here is, is that uh, the administration knew that they would turn out to, to be false, but all they were working with was a time frame of a couple of weeks where they needed to persuade Congress that there was evidence that the first sign, as they put it, the first sign that Saddam Hussein has nuclear weapons would appear in the form of a, you know what, a mushroom cloud. The president said that on the 7th of October. Condoleezza Rice said that on the 8th of October. Victoria Clark of the Pentagon said that on the 9th of October. And on the 10th and the 11th, Congress voted to cede their power to declare war to the President of the United States. Incredible. Never in my 40 years in this town, never in my knowledge of the history of our country has one branch of government so deliberately, so crassly and cynically deceived another branch of government, persuading that other branch to cede its constitutional duty and its right to declare war. And so there is a constitutional crisis here. Um, pity the fact that our founding fathers never perceived there would be a situation where there would be two, two main parties and so when they wrote the impeachment articles, they were counting on, on being able to rely on reasonable men, and unfortunately they were all men in those days, reasonable men being able to decipher what a high crime to misdemeanor is. Uh, they never foresaw a situation where people would be so constrained by party affiliation that, as is now the case with both houses of Congress and the White House being controlled by the same political party, that the majority of these party members will feel unable to speak out and say, yes, uh, I suppose deceiving us into a decision to wage an unprovoked war, I guess that probably qualifies as, a, as a, at least a misdemeanor, wouldn't you say? Instead of that, uh, the uh, Republican majority is able to rein in their, their people to the point where the impeachment provisions of the Constitution cannot be implemented. This is not to say that they should not be, uh, that, that that kind of legislation should not be introduced, but uh, I, it, uh, it just is a very important to note that uh, um, that even, even this egregious deception of one branch by the other uh, has not been addressed here, and the press, the press has sort of yawned and uh, just reported Jessica Lynch, things like that, and uh, missed, missed the constitutional issue here. Real light falls across his face. Okay, if maybe if I have you scoot back a little bit. Sure. That's good. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, okay. And um, so in your judgment, uh, looking at the media in this time period, do you think that they did their the best job they could? Oh, no. Okay, hold on. So I, 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 yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I think the media... Uh, had a miserable performance here. Uh, I, I just should have known, I suppose. Two years ago, uh, we had a, a big reunion of those of us who were involved in Vietnam back in uh, the early 70s when the Pentagon Papers uh, were published by the New York Times and the Washington Post 71, I believe that was. Uh, so it was 30 years. Um, and Daniel Ellsberg and others were all there, some of the correspondents. Uh, but all of the, the people who were at middle levels then, like uh, Rick Smith and, and from the Times, no longer with the Times, and other people, some of the lawyers who were involved, they were all so proud, and Dan Ellsberg made a speech, and everyone was patting themselves on the back. You know, we really faced up to Ronald, uh, not to Richard Nixon. Um, he, he did, uh, for the first and only time in our history, 
issue a restraining order, pre-publication restraining order. We went ahead anyway. You know, were we courageous and did we do the right thing? We thought we'd all end up in jail maybe, but we did the right thing. And a lady raised her hand and she said, tell me, I suppose uh, there was a similar situation today. I suppose there was a Pentagon Papers today that needed to be published. There was, must have been, seemed like five minutes, it must have been about 45 seconds of complete silence. Finally, Rick Smith, previously of the New York Times, spoke up and he cleared his throat and he says, well, <clears throat> I, w I wouldn't count on it today. I wouldn't count on the fact that our, our papers would publish today. And the next person said, yeah, probably not today. By the time they went down the line, the consensus was, forget about it today. And I said to myself, wow, wow. There it is. There it is right there. These are the people still employed by these wonderful exemplars of the Fourth Estate. And they're saying that the Pentagon Papers, that their management wouldn't publish them today. There's a sea change. And so when I watched the, the cheerleading for the war. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe if I could have you uh, recap um you know the history, or just you know maybe in uh, four four or five sentences, the the uh, the Pentagon Papers and them not being published today. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of police around here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, when uh, on the occasion of the thirtieth anniversary of the publication of the Pentagon Papers in, in seventy one, this was two years ago. Um, we had a little gathering of those who were involved there, and there was great pride exhibited in the fact that uh, they went ahead and published them. And someone asked, well, would that happen today? And the answer was, well, the answer was long and coming, like a whole minute of, uh, of absolute silence. And then the people still with the New York Times and the Washington Post conceded that, don't count on it, probably wouldn't happen today. No, wouldn't happen today. So there's a sea change there, a real sea change in how our press uh, operates. And instead of that kind of thing, what we observed in the lead up to the war was a whole bunch of cheerleading, a whole bunch of uh, uh, simply accepting at face value the propaganda that was being emitted. You know, it reminded me of the Gulf War I, where that uh, little Kuwaiti girl uh, made that story about the incubators and the Iraqis. Iraqi soldiers coming in and throwing the babies on the floor and all that stuff. And that was, it worked. It was the same sort of thing. It worked for the time it needed to work. <clears throat> and we was later found out that it was uh, made out of whole cloth and she was the Kuwaiti ambassador's daughter. But it was enough to persuade not only Congress but the UN to say, well, these Iraqis are really terrible. We have to give President Bush the first uh, the power, the permission to wage war. So uh, it's this pattern of uh, being able to maintain the deception long enough to get what you want. And then when it comes out later, you know, who's going to care? Or, you know, they'll put it on page A28 and we'll escape, we'll achieve our aim. It's really, I suppose I should no longer be surprised by it, but as an American, I really am. There's one other point uh, about, uh, about this. One second. What? Oh, let's get back Okay. My, uh, Colleagues and I were, were really baffled by these weapons of mass destruction claims. There were so many disconnects there, you know. Why didn't they share that information with the UN? Why was it that every time they sent the UN out, it was a wild goose chase, they didn't find anything? Why was it that uh, people came out from Congress when they were briefed by Rumsfeld and Cheney, sort of shaking their heads and saying, well, you know, that wasn't very persuasive? And uh, so, that was, that was always kind of a, a real conundrum for us, and and I we're, we proceed pretty collegially. So when someone drafts something, we kind of get everybody to, and you know, we we don't reduce it to the lowest common denominator, but we're sharply engaged. And I wanted to say there aren't any weapons of mass destruction, you know. And I listen to my colleagues who are who are more a little bit more restrained, and I respect them very much. And and the consensus was that. The President of the United States has said that there were about 10 times in the last month. The Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, the Assistant for National Security. And they're not saying probably, they're saying they are there. So they must have something. <laughs>
You know, they must have something they're not sharing with, with anybody. And, you know, the President of the United States, you know, should deserve the benefit of the doubt, you know? Okay, well, you know, I, I relented and said, okay, yeah, it really is strange that they would be saying this so baldly and so often and so definitively. Maybe my friends are right. Now it turns out that our trust was misplaced that this president does put out information that is r wrong, boldly, numerous times, definitively, with great rhetorical emphasis. And so the question now is, uh, what should the presumption be when the president is talking about something important? That he's telling the truth or that he's not telling the truth? And I, I have to say that, uh, uh, that not only in this area but in domestic policy and other things, my presumption, and I hate to say this because I'm a loyal American, is that we have to look very closely at what the president is saying, and we can no longer give him the benefit of the doubt that he's telling the truth, because on this key issue, he clearly was not telling the truth about weapons of mass destruction. He was not telling the truth about ties between al-Qaeda and Iraq, and those were the two reasons, ostensible reasons, given for waging an unprovoked war. What are some of the leads at the the, the press could have uh, followed up on that you remember little nuggets that you heard of like a big red flag would go up and say oh hey that's interesting I would like to see some follow-up on that and um, not uh, yeah well there was some some administration spokesman uh, you know senior administration officials who would be quoted by this or that journalist saying uh, you know, there may not be many weapons of mass destruction or if you're looking for a big stockpile there may not be any there well why didn't they go after those people? You know, say, well, what do you mean there may not be? Any? Well, you know, instead it was sort of at the bottom of a story. You know, Pat Roberts, uh, the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, I remember him coming out of a meeting by Rumsfeld and Cheney. You know, and he came out, and one of the reporters said, "Well, what does it look like? How, how is the evidence uh, of weapons of mass destruction?" And Senator Roberts said, "Oh, it's compelling, compelling." And uh, the journalist said, "Well." Can you give me an example? He said, yeah, here's, it. here's an example. He said, uh, photography has shown uh, truck A uh, going under shed B where uh, process C is believed to occur. And uh, so the reporter says, uh, Senator, do you find that compelling? He said, oh, yes, very compelling. They've cut this down to a real science zone. And the reporter just left scratching his head. Now, that should have been a, a major story. If that was as compelling as the evidence got, you know, then uh, we were in trouble, and we were. Okay, and uh, let's see. Um, so in this whole process, it seemed like there's a whole slew of alternative competing hypotheses that were not even explored. And so, can you talk about kind of the the process that um, could have happened by the press to? to kind of dig into those, or to, to even think about it in, in terms of other alternatives. You mean weapons of mass destruction? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the press uh, played a, an awful game on these weapons of mass destruction. You recall that after the invasion of Iraq started, uh, there were none found immediately, except, oops, there was a report that was somewhere found, and that report that somewhere found we get on page one of the Washington Post and New York Times, and then three days later, well, but they turned out not to be weapons of mass destruction. That would get on page A28, okay? And there were, oh, there were at least 10 of those instances. This is Judith Miller, who's a spokesman for, for Jollibee and, and others, uh, she got front page treatment for a lot of these things, and, and her sourcing was, on the face of it, dubious. And yet, front page New York Times, this weapons of mass destruction found, three days later, page 28, no, they weren't turned. So they should have smelled the rat right away. And then the, you know, the, the answers given by the Pentagon, you know, uh, why, why have there been no weapons of mass destruction found? Well, we got more important things to do. We're fighting an enemy. We're, we're waging a war. Well, you know, I was in the Army. I was an Army officer. And if I had any suspicion at all that there were weapons of mass destruction to be used against my troops, that would be priority number one, I'll tell you. I would have found whatever chemical or biological weapons were out there. 
and uh, that's how I, I that would be the first step that I would use in fighting this war. And it's just inconceivable to me that the press would take that as a kind of a uh, an okay explanation, you know. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. Why don't you talk a little bit about what, what kind of thoughts are going through your head, maybe in a, you know, a minute or two, when on March 7th you heard about the Niger forgeries for the first time, officially, from IAEA. Is this from El Barade? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I was watching, <coughs> I was watching the uh, Security Council uh, session there uh, on that day. I was home in the morning, and uh, I, I was open-mouthed in astonishment. El Baradei said in most diplomatic terms that that information on Iraq seeking uranium in Niger was, as he put it, uh, uh, not authentic. <laughs> not authentic? Not authentic? What do you mean? You never say not authentic diplomatically unless it was a forgery or something like that. And so it came out that it was a forgery. And I said, God, this report that was false on its face, <coughs> now we know it was based on a forgery? How are we gonna how are we gonna deal with this one? <coughs> well, you know how we deal how we dealt with that one? <coughs> Colin Powell grew up in the same part of the Bronx that I did. He was a year ahead of me in school. We lived about a mile away from each other, didn't know each other at the time. But I know the lingo in the Bronx and when you're really caught like this, you know, as he was with one of the Sunday talk shows, and they said, Well, what do you what do you make of, of this uh, re, you know, this this ex, ex, exposing of this as not authentic? And uh, he said, uh, well, if, uh, if that was not right, uh, fine. Well, that kind of tone would always have been accompanied by an obscene gesture uh, where I grew up and where he grew up. At least he spared us the, supreme ge the, the uh, obscene gesture. But the attitude was just incredibly uh, arrogant. And that's uh, sort of the hallmark of, of the folks that he associates with now. Okay, and um, maybe to, to finish up the uh, links with uh, Iraq and Al Qaeda, um, give maybe you know a few minute summary of that. Well, <clears throat> I it was very clear that we could smell a rat on that from day one because at nine eleven, of course, we know that uh, Donald Rumsfeld and Wolf Woods were ever, were already saying let's go get Iraq now, but the most telling thing for me uh, came out later, and it was uh, Wesley Clark going on TV that same day and getting, re, uh, getting a call from the White House saying, blame it on Iraq. Now, Wesley Clark... Well, I just want to interrupt. That sure. was after... So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about okay. the time frame of mm -hmm. just, uh, if you can remember, yeah. stuff that was uh, leaking out uh, just yeah. you know, from reports. Yeah. Well, it was, it was very clear that there was a propaganda campaign here, and so those of us who know about such things were always distrustful that this had any real substance to it. Um, the ties between 9-11 and Al-Qaeda were pretty clear. Uh, Colin Powell promised a white paper on that, which he never delivered, and now it's clear why that happened. There was, it wasn't that there wasn't enough evidence, it was that there was too much evidence, and people would have said, well, why, the, why didn't you do something about it if you knew about that? Uh, but uh, what a stretch it would be. Uh, to link that to Iraq. Iraq and uh, Osama bin Laden were enemies. Uh, Iraq was, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein was accused of being an infidel by Osama bin Laden. So, you know, it just didn't parse. And uh, those of us who've been around a while uh, could see that it didn't parse. And the wonder was, the real miracle was, that our press couldn't see that uh, for what it was. Okay, great. I think that's, that's it.